ungenile bei Ort, ungenile Maspana. Papiz und Katatin, du tust und verlass. Guck, ungenile bei Ort, und was du da tust, und was du da nimmst, Maspana, sie schickern sein, und verlass. It's a bitterly cold Sunday morning in Kanyamazane. The township is half an hour's drive away from Nelspruit, the capital of Mpumalanga. It's about seven o'clock. Most people are heading off to church. But the anti-privatization forum is out in force, and they're calling residents to a meeting about disturbing developments in the area. The municipality of Nelspruit and the water provision company have had it with local residents. If you don't pay your account, uh, employees from Bywater will come and close water, cut water. Uh, sometimes they'll just reduce the, the, the speed of water that you receive or that you use. And then uh, from there they'll send, leave a letter also to say if you don't make your payments within so many days, then you will totally cut your water. The council and water company say more than half of these people do not pay for services. They owe millions of rands. But defaulters will have their houses sold out from under them if they don't make a plan to settle their debt. Greater Nelspruit was all shook up last month when a list appeared in the local newspaper. It named 14 people whose houses would be repossessed to settle their water and service debts. In the past, people were have no problem regarding payment because we used to pay only one account from the town council, which includes water, sewerage and everything. And it was 14 rand 45. And then it came later from the town council that they bring in by water. It's where the problem started. Everyone says that their problem started when by water came. A lot of people didn't want by water to take over a service as essential as water from the council. By water is a British company. It runs water services in many parts of the world, from Malaysia to the Philippines. In 1999, Bywater teamed up with a local black empowerment company. They formed the Greater Nelspruit Utility Company. Locally, people call it Gnook. The deal was simple. Gnook would take over services from the Nelspruit municipality and rent their main water and sewage works. They'd bring water to the vast and very poor rural hinterland surrounding Greater Nelspruit. A substantial loan from the Development Bank of Southern Africa would help to fund the infrastructure. The 30-year concession was hailed as a pioneering model for the rest of water-hungry South Africa. Brian Sims arrived in South Africa at the beginning of last year to run Gnook. His high hopes didn't last long. Well, I, I came with a great deal of optimism because I've been doing this type of work for a long time now. Um, in other some third world countries, some first world countries. Well, I came here from the Philippines, where you have very, very wealthy people living alongside very poor people. The big challenge or the big change, the difference between here and elsewhere is that most people elsewhere do actually pay for services they receive, even, in, even when they're really poor. Knook descended on households where water already flowed. There they installed meters. Other houses got water for the first time, it's then the people say that disaster befell them. Take what happened to the Gaba household. Everyone here lives on Granny Anat Gaba's pension. She says she supports eight children and grandchildren. None of them have jobs. <laughs> Gnook installed a water meter at Anna's house. She was at their mercy. She and her eight dependents had come to rely on their outside tap. 
There was no way they could cut expenses further, though. She just couldn't afford water on her 800 rand pension. And the water death rose quickly. It was much the same for Julian Gakula. His whole household runs on one government pension, and Ngakula finds himself borrowing money from neighbors regularly just to get through the month. So when I'm paying my hand now, that's how the number. I must pay first before I um, buy some milli meal. And go with that man and go with that lady and pay their money I'm already burning to him. All right, after that, go to buy that milli meal. It is 200. That millimeter is 200. Now, 50. 200. All right. I'm come now and buy that and I'm some sugar and a little bit meat. No, not enough meat. A little bit meat. It's already finished at night. Ngakula says if he could, he would pay for water. But it's impossible. He's unemployed. As are half the residents of Greater Nelspruit. Even those who are employed are finding it impossible to budget for water, like Alsen Inyati. He's worked on a government farm for 45 years. He takes home 1,800 rand after tax. He sends four children to school, pays rent and buys food. Transport is a major cost. Kanyamazane is about half an hour from Nelspreg. One bus ticket costs the family 200 rand per month. This figure they The municipality of Nelspreit, now called Mbombela, believed they couldn't provide for the community's water needs without input from the private sector. Um, we did a socio-economic survey before we did the concession, where we tested perspe uh, perspectives and, and perceptions of people, and that's what they, they told us at the time. You know, improve the service and then we'll pay. And then services were improved and uh, didn't happen. Well, people give a number of reasons. In fact, they differ from one meeting. If you are having a meeting every weekend, one Sunday they will tell you different ex reasons or excuses. The next Sunday it's different story. For example, they were querying uh, meter reading. The first bills Gnook sent out were much higher than the people were used to. To top it all, users were shocked to receive three separate bills, one for water from Gnook, another for services from the council, and yet another for electricity from ESCOM. No one paid anything. Arrears piled up. People paid a flat rate in the past, irrespective. They were not um, built according to consumption. Meters were not read. And they paid like five rand a month for all the municipal services. Now, obviously, it's not sustainable. And um, that's why it collapsed because people made illegal connections to the system. The system was not designed to carry so many connections and that's, that's why it collapsed. And there's always been illegal connections. When we first went into Kanya Mazan, we removed 7,000 illegal connections. That's what these guys did. Now there's only, we only had 8,000 customers in Kanya Mazan and there were 7,000 illegal connections. Gnook believed that money would flow in once they cleaned up illegal connections, improved the service and connected more paying customers to the grid. As agreed, Gnook built a new sewage plant at Matsulu using the latest technology. In other places, they fixed or replaced crumbling apartheid-era infrastructure. Many more infrastructure developments were in the pipeline, but they ground to a halt in 2001 because the money didn't come in. 
Then, Anouk had to work out what to do about those who weren't paying. What we did was, we said, right, OK, people are not paying their bills. We have a choice of doing two things here. We, we, we can restrict the flow to what we consider to be the basic level, and at the same time, we won't bother sending bills out, because it seems pointless sending bills out where people haven't got to pay for the, for the supply. So we said, OK, we'll take the metres out as well. So we took the metres out and put in restricted flow. The restricted flow strategy was easily foiled. The Kanyamazane Anti-Privatisation Forum launched Operation Vula Manzi. They simply bypassed the affected pipes. The rift between the people and the providers was growing. We've got professional plumbers here. We've got people who know how to connect and disconnect. Whatever pipe, you can think of water, you can think of electricity, telephone, whatsoever. Now they said, no, we are volunteering. We will assist all those who their water had been cut off. Let them come in front, give us their residential numbers so that we go and reconnect. And we found that we went around in this cyclical cycle. But as fast as we were removing the illegal connection, people were going back putting it in because they felt that the restricted volume of water was insufficient. And let's face it, they'd been used to a higher volume of water before the restrictions went in. Despite the fact they weren't paying for it, they'd actually got accustomed to a higher level. So we found it quite difficult to keep up with this cyclical arrangement. After five years of going in circles, Anouk is now in trouble. Confidential reports tabled in the Mbembela Council were leaked to special assignment. These show that the losses are huge, that community relations have soured, that the company, the council and national government are taking the problem extremely seriously, and that foreign shareholders could pull out unless the council agrees to an immediate rescue package that includes money. Some have mentioned a sum of 109 million rand. But council itself is in deep trouble. The customers who are not paying for water are also not paying their municipal rates and service charges. These fund things like sewage, refuse removal, parks. Mbombela's losses are in excess of 100 million rand. So as a last resort, Mbombela and Knuk finally declared war. It's a question of discipline to our mind. We think that communities are not disciplined enough. If we look at the spending patterns on some of the other more luxury goods like cell phones and on uh, satellite television and the type of cars that people drive. It was just felt that people are ill-disciplined and uh, basic services should become part of your monthly budget. Knuck and the council randomly selected 14 houses. They were chosen from a large group council believes can definitely pay for services and rates, but who have outstanding arrears. The houses were put up for sale in court. But here we're targeting me and me and anybody who's, who's employed. And most of these people are having an above average life style. So we, we should pay. So that we should start understanding that it's a responsibility of every one of us as, as in the country to ensure that we assist in contributing to the level of services. This house was almost sold. The owner had joined the payment boycott in solidarity with his impoverished neighbors. But Jan Mazibuko was able to settle his debt just before the sale. In this way, council and the water company believe they'll break the stubborn cycle of non-payment. We are naturally very upbeat and have the appetite to go and recover the money. And then we expect the people to develop the same appetite of wanting to pay. And the engagement there is very nice and natural. But if you pay, there'll be no problem. If you don't pay, there'll be a tension. I said, OK, these comrades were within council. Seemingly, they've adopted white uh, type of approach. They've lost their Ubuntu. They've lost their black philosophy. They've lost their communalism approach, which prevails amongst us blacks. Why should people in Nesprit pay at 98% and then the people in the township not pay? And we are not insensitive to the pensioners. It's not even the pensioners who are not paying. It's people who are receiving salaries who are not paying, which makes it even worse. Why should that pensioner pay for me, a teacher, me, a lawyer, and the pensioner pays for me? It's scandalous. So those comrades, by saying you're going to sell a house of a person affecting his own children, everybody, says to me, some and some of you have changed to become an African. You become a white of some kind. The thinking. Thinking has changed. Your, your paradigm shift has gone that far that you become a whitey. Then I say, where is transformation? 
Harrison Nkambule was not lucky enough to have ready cash to save his home. A building contractor, he only gets odd jobs. The one he's doing at the moment hasn't paid since January. And the government of West Tembi is about to sit out Shala Konala. And the letter of the P. W. Naleon. And the mean a valent to Missel of Patala. I know about Missel of Patala. Missel of Patala. What are the new Shule and Aleon de la Leon, 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 Aleon Harrison Nkambule's neighbor, Laysen Mazibuko, is in the same boat. His job also last paid in January. He says he couldn't afford the 50 rand a month that council wanted from him. So council has sold his house. Council don't want to sell people's property. That's the last thing that we want to do. We are in the business of providing shelter, not taking away shelter. So we were quite pleased that people came forward and made arrangements. In those cases where people didn't make arrangements, obviously we had to go the full route. I think uh, the message came through now that uh, council is adamant to get their money and at the end of the day uh, people will lose their property. This is an ongoing process. The next list of people are already targeted and we are already in the process of, of uh, advertising their houses for sale. The dusty settlement of Tonga lies about an hour's drive away from Nelspruit towards Mozambique. It's surrounded by irrigated farmland, but like much of this region at the moment, Tonga is in the grip of drought. It was here that Nelspruit based journalist Zibonele Ntuli first heard rumors of cholera. He asked Tandi Nyambi if she's heard anything. <laughs> National government supplies water in Tonga. Up to now it's been free, but the pipes are empty. They've been empty for at least three months. The drought is one reason. Illegal connections to an aging grid is another. You can pay a lot of money to have safe, clean water delivered by someone who has a car and can fetch it from reservoirs far away. Free water is delivered by government tankers. But Induna Samson Mandomane Ngomane says this is not ideal. The Vatrikan may bring free water, but delivery is erratic and drinking this water is a gamble. Kate and Gamona's family depended on the Vatrikan for their supply. Then Kate died last month. She contracted cholera after drinking water that the tank delivered to their home. Kate's brother, Amos Ntuli, is now in charge. <laughs> You can wait for the Vatrakan. You can pay someone a lot of money to deliver. 
or you can take your chances at the Nkomazi River and its offshoots. Many people use this water because it's free and the risk is not immediately apparent. But at least 250 people have contracted cholera around here. As far as we could find out, four have so far died. Next month, national government will hand over water provision in Tonga to the Nkomazi local council. Meters will be installed and water laid on to individual stands. Residents will be expected to pay. With the money that is available and the staff that is available, they will find quite soon that water will not get to everybody unless they start exercising some control over water use. And they will find that it's going as difficult for a public authority as it's proving to be for a private authority. We know that the uh, non-payment that's happening in Nell Spring is making it very, very difficult for the company to stay there. Um, I have to say that non-payment would make it very, very difficult for a local government to run the service properly. So uh, what's happening with uh, the company would happen equally with uh, a local government running it as a public operation. No matter who runs water, local government or private companies, they must give every household in South Africa six free kilolitres of water per month. The problem is, in Greater Nelspread, not everyone is getting it. The utility company says it's because of illegal connections on the grid and low payment. They had to suspend development, and they say as soon as people pay, development will resume, the poor will benefit. But the local anti-privatisation forum, who doubles as the PAC branch, wants more direct help. We need them to understand that, that the 6,000 kilolitres, it's, it's unhelpful to us. Basically, basically, we need free water. The boycotts that were called in the 80s were aimed at changing the government and getting rid of apartheid government. We have to ask whether the boycotts that are being called at the moment are actually about ending democratic government, because they certainly undermine it. They certainly weaken it. And we say all the time to the people who are campaigning uh, against things like paying for water once free basic water is provided, that they're actually destroying the public sector they, can take, they claim to be supporting. They're weakening it. And frankly, once the public sector is destroyed, I'm not sure who's going to come in and, and, and uh, provide the services. Certainly, they seem to be clamoring to open the door to the private sector by destroying the public. And we get very confused by that. We've had since 1994 uh, a 19% fall in the income of black people and a 15% increase in the income of white people, according to the government's own statistics. And municipalities can do a little bit, at least, to reverse the implications of that, the disconnections, the cholera and diarrhea problems, uh, the hedonism that allows uh, all of our white neighbors, our wealthy neighbors, to live uh, as if nothing really has changed. In the interests of social justice and real development, Patrick Bond suggests significantly higher tariffs on wealthy suburbs to subsidize the poor. If they have to pay for water, the anti-privatization forum in Kanyamazani says a flat rate of 30 rand for all services is all they'll agree to. <laughs> To me, the identity of a company is not an issue. You know, what people should be concerned about is the quality of service that they are getting. It doesn't matter whether it's foreign company, whether it's a local municipality, still people have to pay for the services. I can give you a categorical statement that we will not withdraw. The uh, promise of free services that ANC made in the 2000 municipal elections, uh, a very, very important step forward in terms of social progress, is systematically being sabotaged by those attitudes. And they're, in a way, a reflection of the durability of apartheid, but instead of racial apartheid, it's, uh, it's a renewed and virulent form that's now being called quite openly class apartheid. Unfortunately, the council doesn't have the luxury to sit down and, and argue ideological debates. It has to get water to people and very soon. One of the, um, the really irresponsible slogans that we have is this, the, the, that one, smash the meter, enjoy the water. Smash the meter, 
smash local government, smash your chances in the future. That should be the slogan. And one has to be worried about uh, campaigns that run on that kind of basis. They certainly aren't anything to do with a sustainable future for anybody in South Africa.